He was a keynote speaker for the launch session as well. Jeff uh, is a charter member and entrepreneur in residence with Faskins, who are our venue host today. He's a lawyer, a serial entrepreneur. He's also a trusted advisor who works with high growth companies. He's been involved in startups, acquisitions, and financing for a variety of businesses in industries which vary from real estate, hospitality, film and television production, insurance, cosmetics, financing, high technology, alternative energy, investment management, etc. Jeff did co-found the Toronto chapter of Young Entrepreneur Organization as well. It's these days called Entrepreneur's Organization. In 1998, he co-chaired the annual uh, EO convention of over 500 entrepreneurs, which was held in Toronto. He created series of lessons from the edge, wherein entrepreneurs share their worst mistakes and businesses and the lessons they learned. This was a seminar series which really made Jeff famous, I guess. Uh, as a result of that, uh, he wrote a book called Lessons from the Edge, which was a bestseller, and it was inspired by the success of these seminars. He has spoken in many countries, including uh, Thailand, India, Malaysia, Nepal, US, and Canada. He has a degree in economics from Brown University and law degree from University of Western Ontario. He is a graduate of Birthing of Joints Giants Executive Education Program of MIT. He's also a graduate of Director's Education Program of ICD. And more than anything else, he is a thinker, a writer, speaker, and he's also my mentor. Please help me welcome Jeff. Thank you. Um, so we're going to uh, start, Let, continue eating. Uh, I'm going to play a video. I was, um, something I saw on, I used to touch things, something I saw on, um, on Facebook last week um, that I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, if you've ever read the book when you were little kids, uh, Oh, the Places I'll Go by Dr. Zeus. Yeah. And even when I say it, it, it kind of chokes me up. Like, it brings tears to my eyes. I, I, it's one of my favorite books. You know, talk about business books and, and books that you want to share. Well, every time uh, one of my relatives, nieces, nephews, whatever, cousins, go off to university, um, you know, we give them a little check to send them on their way, but I always give them a copy of that book. And at Burning Man, I don't know when they did it. Do you guys know what Burning Man is? It's not part of my demographic, but maybe yours. Um, although my stepbrother was there this year, and that's a whole other story. Um, but they did a rendition of All the Places You'll Go. And I just think the theme of today uh, about you know, what is it that makes an entrepreneur and who's an entrepreneur, you know, this touches on a lot of it because part of it's about you know, sort of going with the waves. Instead of fighting the waves, you've got to surf the waves. And oh, the places you'll go. So it's a little longer than I would have liked, but I think it's worth it. So while you eat and finish, let's watch it together. Wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. Wherever you 
everything that uh, the previous speakers talked about in terms of tenacity and uh, everything, everything and everything that, that, that was talked about uh, 
was really touched on in that, uh, in that piece. I'm sorry, I'm just collecting myself. You know, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm, as you can see, pretty passionate about entrepreneurship. It's, it's, I live and breathe it. Um, and I've thought a lot about it. Um, and like most people that you saw in the stats, I don't have a formal business education. Um, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I practiced law briefly, and then I started a business. And we figured it out as we went along, like you heard and like you've heard. And uh, we had successes, and we had failures, and we had naysayers, and we had it all. Um, and through it all, and through the ups and downs, I guess my education was really about going to the school of hard knocks um, and figuring it out the hard way. Um, and then the other thing I did was uh, get very involved, as you heard, with what was then called the Young Entrepreneurs Organization, now called the Entrepreneurs Organization, because it used to be for people under 40, it's now for anybody. So. They changed the name when they changed the focus. But I went to all of their education events. Uh, you know, every month we had a session here in Toronto. They had conventions, one of which I chaired a bunch of years ago. And I was just a sponge to learn not only from the speakers with their sizzle, sometimes a little steak, but also peer to peer learning. Uh, because, you know, one of the characteristics that I didn't see up on any of the previous slides. Um, is that I think entrepreneurs are a little bit ADD and you know they don't have the patience to sit in school and they don't have the patience to read you know books and they, they really just want to get out and do it and get the, into it and figure it out and make it happen and so because of that tendency I think what most entrepreneurs look to do is they look for mentors they look for other people who have sort of walked a mile in their shoes um, other entrepreneurs may be in non-competing businesses that are on the same journey and to share that experience and to share those lessons that they learn. Um, so that was part of my education. And then lastly, um, you heard about the book. It was a bit of an accident. I, I would say that I'm sort of the accidental author. I never set out to write a book. In fact, when I was in grade 13, this dates me, uh, the fact that there was grade 13. I did that too. My <laughs> English teacher. <laughs> you know, told me that I was basically illiterate. And it was very, very tough on me. And when I went to Brown University, here I'm going to this Ivy League school, and I'm totally freaked out because I'm told I'm illiterate. So I took a remedial English class, just to be sure, first year, because I was just scared out of my mind. P.S. The first copy that came out of the book, I sent to Mr. Webb at Upper Canada College. <laughs> and my son ended up going to UCC, so I ended up seeing a lot of him. He was this young teacher. I guess he was trying to make his mark. Today, he's probably closer in age to me. But nevertheless, at that time, uh, he really busted my chops. Um, so, but through this exercise of, of writing this book, uh, I had the, the luxury of doing two things. I interviewed over 200 entrepreneurs from around the world to find out what their biggest mistakes in business were and what lessons that they learned. And then I traveled the world talking about it and talking to people and hearing their stories and really sort of rounding out my education. So, um, you know, for me, I'm one of those lifetime learners. I mean, I sat here tonight, I'm listening and hanging on every word that the other speakers are, are saying because there's, there's pearls of wisdom there that every one of us can take away. So what I want to start off by saying is that I commend you all for being here. And because I, I think this is part of the process and part of the journey. Um, and I do agree that, in fact, I've never, I, I once spoke at uh, Western, at Ivy. And I started off my lecture by saying, I don't think you can teach entrepreneurship in business school. Well, that, you know, a whole debate ensued, and it was very controversial. I've never been asked back. <laughs> <laughs> but I do go to Ryerson, and I will go to U of T, but Western, I'm, even though I'm an alum, I'm now apparently persona non grata. Um, but I guess the point I was making is that for all the reasons that you saw before, those are key, in my view, to becoming an entrepreneur. And the MBA stuff, the stuff that you're going to learn in this program, are only going to make you a better entrepreneur. But unless you have those key characteristics, those qualities that you've already heard about and some more that maybe I'll, I'll share my thinking on the subject, um, 
you know, you're, it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter how many degrees and, and, and PhDs and MBAs and whatever. It's all good stuff, and I'm pushing my kids to, you know, go to grad school and do that. So I'm not discouraging you from going to school. I'm not like, you know, 500 startups or, or you know, the Thiel uh, Foundation where I'm saying, you know, let's get kids ready to work and starting business right out of high school. I'm not for that. But I'm saying that you either got it or you ain't. Okay? Entrepreneurs either have it or they don't. It's these qualities, these characteristics that you had, some of them I don't think you can develop. I, I really don't. And that's where we got into this debate at Western. But that's just my view. So the agenda for my short presentation this evening will involve sharing my thoughts on sort of what do entrepreneurs have in common? What, you know, what's the common link? And then I'll share what I think are maybe the five or six top lessons that I learned through writing this book. And then maybe if we have time after John's presentation, we can either do a Q&A or we'll stay and chat afterwards. Most speeches like mine are usually you know, part of a book tour. You, know, you write a book and then you go make a speech and you hope that people buy the book. Um, and while it's true, it'd be nice if you go out and buy the book, Mine sort of happened the other way around. As you heard, I created these seminars where entrepreneurs would get up on a panel and tell their war stories, and then the book kind of came from there. And this is really just an extension of that. And, and I guess, you know, it's what I said earlier about peer-to-peer um, -peer learning. As much as we enjoyed these speakers with sizzle and PowerPoints and all the rest of it, it was hearing from people who were at the edge, who, you know, had lived and breathed these issues. Um, and as these people came up and told their stories, the audience was silent. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. And on occasion, you'd see actually people leave the room and call their partner or their lawyer or their rabbi or I don't know who. But people literally left the room uh, to deal with an issue. And, and all of the things that these entrepreneurs would share uh, were things that the audience were up at night worrying about. They were either dealing with or afraid to be dealing with. And so this was really powerful stuff, real take-home value. And I guess if there's any genius in it, if there was a gap there, it was recognizing that people really want to learn from one another, and there's some value in that. Um, so this became the highest rated session uh, at, uh, at, at, at EO. Uh, so we became a, a tradition and every year, and they still do it even though I'm not there very often, uh, but it's one of the big things. And I just did one here for the Toronto chapter and had some great speakers. And we actually did it on top of the CN Tower, talking about, and they did the, uh, the oh, walk. Yeah. <laughs> so talking about being around the edge. I mean, it, was, you know, it was a pretty clear metaphor. Um, but the whole point of the book was to capture this intellectual capital, to understand what those lessons are. <coughs> and you know, as I said, as I've gone through this process, it, it's, it's caused me to think a little bit about, you know, started to think about like what what do they all have in common? You know, who are these entrepreneurs and what do they have in common? Because some people are great salespeople. You know, they could sell ice to Eskimos. They were, you know, they're just incredibly dynamic, persuasive people. You know, some of them were inventors, came up with incredible products. I mean, you heard a lot about Steve Jobs. Nobody said he was a particularly nice guy, but he was a genius. Um, and then you have sort of the MBA or people coming out of business that you know, know how to run a business, you know, seen the gap, and started based on that. That's probably fewer, uh, fewer people come from that. And, and the other thing that I've observed is that entrepreneurs are often born, and some of them are made. Now when I say born, I mean, you know, you know these people. They've been selling, you know, uh, lemonade on the street from the time they were 10, and then it was, you know, baseball cards or hockey cards or, you know, there was always something on the go. They cut the grass, they sold t-shirts in their university dorm. I mean, these people were just born entrepreneurs. They couldn't help themselves. It was in their DNA. The made entrepreneurs are people who uh, come to entrepreneurship by necessity. They lose a job, they come to a new country and can't find their way through uh, you know, the, the traditional uh, uh, structures. Um, you know, one way or another, they find themselves uh, without employment, um, and they got to make a go of it. And they got to make ends meet, and necessity being the mother of invention, people figure it out. Um, I probably am more of the made entrepreneur than the born. I won't bore you with the details of my story, but, you know, I was, uh, uh, contrary to what you heard, uh, 
uh, uh, Cyrus' uh, presentation. Uh, I was the rich kid, okay? So it was like the exact opposite in many ways. I was the rich kid, I had all the opportunities, I had everything, I'm a lawyer, I went, you know, all the education, everything, and yet uh, here I am. Why? Because um, my family business failed. And uh, I was supposed to be the leader of the next generation and there was no family business. So here am I, literally on the edge, uh, my wife and I had a big house in Forest Hill. We owed well over a million dollars. I was all of 32 years old. I'd left my law practice at Blake's, and our business was in the same industry as my family business, and was, which was real estate, and the market had crashed in 90, 91, 92, and it was a nightmare. We lost everything. I lost my home. I had to start from scratch. They weren't hiring lawyers, and Blake's probably hired me in the first place because they wanted my family business. So I was in a real bad place. And um, necessity really caused me to figure this out. And I won't again go into all the details, but that was really, I was made that day as an entrepreneur and I really had no choice. You know, you've heard about tenacity and you've heard about all the other characteristics, but there's one thing that um, I didn't hear. And um, it may be the one thing, and I would suggest it's that one thing that we as entrepreneurs all have um, and, you know, you may have all these other things, but it's just that one kernel. Does anybody have a thought on what that might be? Vision. Say it again. Uh, vision. Vision's a good one. Anything else? Luck. Luck? Yeah, I, luck. I good and bad. I won't say that because... You I know the answer. <laughs> He's heard me before. Yeah, the guys from U of T have heard me before. They can't answer either. Uh, anybody? All right. I think, and this is my humble opinion, I think it's courage. I think it's that, and courage encapsulates all of that stuff, you know, the naysayers, the risk, I mean, all that stuff is encapsulated in that one word, courage. You know, you take on these companies that are bigger, better financed, and everybody's telling you not to, and you still do it. You know, it's like they say it in the Wizard of Oz, courage, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, I just think that that's the one thing. Everything else is true, and I don't disagree with what you heard, but I think you've got to have courage. The second thing that I found is that entrepreneurs never use what I will refer to as the F word. Now, in some contexts, you know, it's a four letter word, and, you know, we won't, but I will share what the F word is with you. They never use that word. You won't hear me say it. Okay? It doesn't happen. We. <laughs> We're on to our next venture. It was a learning experience. There's so many euphemisms for the word, but <laughs> entrepreneurs never say, right? Never. We got so many words for it instead, but they're all forward thinking. They're all positive. They're all to make it better, to iterate, to pivot, whatever the, the phrase of the day is. It's all the same stuff, right? <clears throat> so that's kind of my take on entrepreneurship and I don't disagree with anything you've heard but to me those are the kind of key things that we just never quit uh, we're fearless and, um, and we come from different places so there's room for all of you depending on what you want to do and, and where you come from so what are the lessons learned so I, as I said I, we like to learn from one another um, the other thing I learned was the lessons were, the mistakes were all the same. Uh, they happened over and over and over again. It was really rare when you had some, like, you know, earth-shaking, new, novel mistake that somebody came up with. It was all the same stuff. But what happens is people are making decisions on the fly with limited resources. And, 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 you're, and you're just making compromises and you're making decisions with limited information, limited money, limited people, whatever it is, and you're making those decisions under pressure, and you'll make mistakes. And so the whole idea of the book is to give you a little for, you know, foretelling of what's to come. These are the kind of pitfalls that you will face. When they arrive, maybe having read the book, you'll see where you might go left instead of right or whatever. Um, and that's the whole point. When we wrote the book, we, we found when we collected the stories, there were sort of five basic themes that they fell into. Um, number one was leadership. And these are kind of general themes. Number two um, is people, so hiring, motivating, 
and people. The third is partnerships. And the fourth is money, so banks and investors and all of that stuff. And the fifth, there are personal issues. You know, what life as an entrepreneur, this entire program of 32 sessions will be fantastic. You'll learn a ton, but you won't learn about your lifestyle in terms of what it's going to be like day to day. Those 61 hours, the, you know, laptop on your vacation. That's, they're not going to talk about that here other than today. And I think, you know, there's a whole side of being an entrepreneur that's the personal side. The freedom on one hand, but, and the responsibility on the other, and the stress and the risk and all the rest of it. So, you know, it's, it's your business, it's your life. A lot of people are going to be looking at you and relying on you. Um, you know, looking after yourself and looking after the personal side of life is almost as important, maybe more important than all the rest. So, let's talk about these five uh, issues. Uh, five, uh, and the five lessons, the first one <clears throat> is on leadership. And somebody said it earlier, but uh, over here, the key thing is to have a vision. You know, know where you're going. You're not gonna get there if you don't know where you're going. I mean, it sounds trite to say it, but so often, most many people go into business thinking they're going to sell a product or a service to a customer. That's where they're going. But it's way more than that. Know who you are, know who your customer is, know how you're going to get there, and write it down. Communicate it to your stakeholders. It should be like a mantra. People should be able to say it in their sleep. They understand where you're all going and you're all going together. It's, it's that place that you're going in all the places you'll go. Right? It's, it's the end of that street. It's the light at the end of the tunnel. Hopefully it's not a train. <laughs> the second major topic was people. So people. I guess the key lesson I learned about people in talking to all these entrepreneurs was hire slow and fire fast. By hire slow, they mean <laughs> take your time get to know them, make sure they share your values and will be compatible with your culture. Make sure that you know they're, uh, that you get beyond that interview mask. Everybody knows how to read a website and feedback the same crap that you're putting out there. They know how to do that. How do you get beyond that to find out whether they really buy into that culture, whether they're really going to work 70 or 61 hours, whether they're really the right person with the right skills. Take your time. I know companies that do group interviews, they do multiple interviews. Um, I say here hire a headhunter. For startups, that's a big ask. I guess what I'm saying is the best people are already employed. Okay? They're probably not home in their fuzzy slippers. Okay? They, it, I mean, it could be, but you know, the person that you need to take your business to the next level is probably already employed somewhere. And you're going to have to figure out who they are and figure out how to get them. So sometimes that's a headhunter. You can't afford one, then you're going to have to figure it out yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. Check references. Really make sure you got the right person. The last point is the key one, though. Hire better than yourself. And the point we heard earlier uh, was, you know, this issue about ego and egotism and self-centered. You've got to know well, who you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and what you need to fill those gaps in the business. There's a book out there, uh, we talked about books, and I'm going to give you a list of books at the end, but a book I highly recommend reading is a book called Unique Ability. Um, <clears throat> uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but the best place, to, you can find it on Amazon, but it's um, The Strategic Coach, Dan Sullivan's uh, business, The Strategic Coach, go to strategiccoach.com. It's one of his disciples wrote this book. The premise of the book is simple. We all have a unique ability. Figure out what it is, do it all day, every day, and then partner or hire people with complementary unique abilities. Very simple. What's more complex is to figure out what your unique ability is, and the book takes you through that. <coughs> and I actually hired a coach about seven or eight years ago when I sold my business and I was trying to decide what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, and I figured out that I wanted to be the trusted advisor to the CEOs of fast growth companies. I went through that process, and I believe that's my unique ability. Figure out what yours is, hire around that, or partner around that. 
And then if you make a mistake, cut bait. Every, very often people, you know, they don't have a replacement, they're short manpower, it's going to cost them severance, they think they can reform the person, forget it. If your instinct tells you it's wrong, it's wrong, get rid of them right away, they'll kill your culture. Hire slow, fire fast. People, oh I said people, sorry. I guess you could tell I could do this thing in my sleep too. Um, partnerships. So partnerships, we could have written a whole book, and I think I may write a book one day on partnerships, because really, everybody had a partnership story. We, we go into partnerships because we're missing something. We lack some kind of resource, and we can't afford to fulfill it otherwise. So we bring in a technical co-founder, we bring in a financial backer, we bring in a customer, we bring, whatever we do, we need them. And sometimes we make compromises and we don't pick the right people because we're making decisions for reasons other than culture, values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an area that's really fraught with danger. Uh, it's something that people take lightly. I've seen people spend more time interviewing prospective employees than they do their own partners. The key is partnerships are like marriage. Easy to get into, ugly, messy to get out of. Think divorce. Get it in writing, it's like the prenup. Figure out all the issues, do, do they share the same values, do you have an exit strategy, figure out how you're going to get out of this thing if it doesn't work out. Define roles, responsibility, and we can do a whole presentation on this. Uh, and if it's not working, this is again a personal view, get out, life's too short, don't be in a bad situation, move on. Money. So uh, one of my grandfathers used to say that he believed in having one God and two bankers. <laughs> and just for clarity's sake, I'm not talking bankers like Royal Bank and TD Bank, because you know, you, you, you know, other than your credit cards, they won't deal with you. So I'm talking about any financial investor, partner, whatever. But you know, have some diversification. You have all your eggs in one basket. If that comes away, you're in trouble. So diversify. But the key lesson that our, that our, that our people that, the, that shared their stories were was raise more than you need and spend less than you, than you get. Invariably, your business plans and your financial projections are going to be wrong. It's going to take longer, cost more. Your revenue is going to come later. Like, there's going to be a million reasons why you're not going to have enough money. So overestimate, and when you got it, treat it like it's your own. Don't get the fancy chairs, the Porsche car, the toys, the ping pong, like just watch your money. Spend it judiciously, it runs out, you never go in a straight line and you'll need more than you, than you, than you have at some point. And when you need it most, there'll be some reason, you know, there'll be a dot com crash or a real estate crash or some other crash or, you know, a plane crashes into buildings or something <laughs> happens and you're going to market to find money and you, nobody's talking to you. And you think it's funny, but I've been there on each one of those occasions, okay? Trying to raise money after 9-11, trying to raise money after the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s. It's a nightmare, okay? Raise more than you need, spend less than you have. I'm going as fast as I can. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Personal. Well, it's kind of like what your mom tells you. You know, eat well, get plenty of sleep, you know, give back, have a spiritual side to life, exercise. The bottom line is you've got lots of people relying on you. Employees, bankers, spouses, banker spouses, employee spouses, <laughs> kids. I mean, everybody's looking to you, right? You got all these people on your back. You better look after yourself. You better look after yourself. Um, you know, when I say spiritual, I don't. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I believe a lot in giving back or find, you know, doing yoga or meditation or whatever it is that helps you kind of stress and, and, and feel sort of centered in the universe. Figure it out, do it, it helps in business, believe me. There'll be nights when you're up all night, there'll be days when you're working crazy hours, there'll be people who let you down and you need to deal with the stress. So the last lesson, we'll call it the, the, the bonus lesson, um, 
it's a little early for you guys because we're all just getting started here, but one of the key things that people forget is why they're in business in the first place. You know, take chips off the table and save for a rainy day. This is not, we're not building, you know, sculptures and uh, the, like Burning Man or whatever. This is a business. Why are we in business? Why are we here? <coughs> to pro provide for our families financial security, right? But people forget that. And as you heard, we're risk takers. So we take risks in our business, and we take risks in our personal investments, and we're rolling the dice, and we're betting on other businesses, and, and, you, and, and, and I mean, it's just it's too much risk. High risk should mean high reward. You should credit or protect yourself. You should take your personal investing. You know, don't have a mortgage on your house if you can afford it. You know, put things in your wife's name or your husband's name or, or, or your kids' names. Like, just put money away for a rainy day because it'll come. So that's really the end of it for me. Um, the book itself was, as I said, you know, this is a summary, we don't need that. The book itself was really a departure from most sort of business books. Most business books are kind of how-to things or you know, celebrity CEOs telling their story. The problem is that most celebrity CEOs, um, not most, but many, particularly in the last 15 years or so, have been carted away in handcuffs. You know, think <laughs> Conrad Black or all the rest of them. And, you know, I'm not so sure that those are the people that we should be setting up as our heroes. You know, to me, the heroes are the Main Street heroes, people who start businesses, people like you who aspire to start businesses, put their financial resources at risk, go to their parents and their whoever, uncles, and, and raise money from friends and family, create jobs, build in the community, give back to the community. I mean, these are the real heroes. And you know, the fact that the city of Toronto is on this bandwagon you know, is illustrative of how important it is to the city and how important it is to the community. So I, you know, my book is about celebrating Main Street heroes because to me, you guys are the heroes. You're here because you want to do something. You want to take responsibility for your own lives, be self-reliant, and build something great. So I commend you all. Um, that, and that's my presentation. The only thing I will share, and I'll do it quickly because I know I've gone way over, books. So, Good to Great, mm -hmm. Jim Collins. The E-Myth, Unique Ability I mentioned. Uh, Rockefeller Habits. By the way, I don't think the guy at Western coined that. I think Vern Harnish at the University of Colorado. That's no, his. no, everybody knows him by it, but he wasn't the first guy. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> It was an academic summer. Interesting. Art of the Start the by Guy stuff. Kawasaki. I would start with those five. You, know, and you won't read them by next week. I mean, this is not a reading assignment on the <laughs> syllabus. But these are books that I would start with. Anyhow, thank you very much.